We spin and we toil, we work all day, sowing and reaping, we store goods away, so we can be dressed well on the day that we die. We dig and drill and waste what we find, break up the earth, leaving little behind, but we will grow lilies in the by and by. Good day. Uh, this is Energy Week with George Harvey, me, and Tom Fennell. Hi. I will give you um, all the items that I found in my excruciatingly dull analysis of the news that I've been doing all week, about three hours a day, and Tom will give you graphic images, which are far less boring. And I will play around with the mice. Oh, <laughs> that's a good idea. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to launch straight in here. I, I look at the, at the um, news every day and, and find what there is and put things up on my blog, uh, geoharvey.wordpress.com. And uh, usually about 10 or 15 items a day. I think I've probably put up about um, 70, 8, 90 items this week. And uh, so I'm just reading the ones that I think are the, are the most interesting. So we'll start with the 21st of February. By a 4 to 1 vote, the Vermont Senate's Natural Resources and Energy Committee approved S-201, a bill that would give communities hosting new energy products more say, projects, I'm sorry, more say in the Public Service Board's review process. That from the Brattleboro Reformer. Um, the purpose here is to make sure that people who object to things have got more ability to object to them. Yeah. So... And and the the people who are who are anxious about renewable energy are I think upset about this. They want it to happen just from the public service board. We'll see how this. Well, I think reading between the lines, I think it's the wind power opponents who are kind of pushing this. Yes, I think that is the case. <laughs> um, but you know, I personally, I think every every community should be generating as much as much of its own power as possible. So that would change the dynamic of this. Well, the concept of having the people have a voice makes sense. I mean, of I totally approve does. of that. Yes, absolutely. But I just, I, I smell a rat here. Yes, <laughs> I agree with you. But I think that there, I think it might backfire when people see that there's a reason why they want to have energy in their own community. Yeah, I've, yeah <clears throat> it's an education process. And I think when people yeah. take a look at it, you know, they're going to say, Hey, why should we pay those people over Saudi Arabia <laughs> <laughs> or Canada? <laughs> we can hire a couple of people here and uh, you know pay some guy who's got some land yeah. here. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, one of the things that I'm not going to be reading about it's a county in California that is allocated. It's basically doing um, renewable energy uh, as a as a zoning area, and they're zoning a ten percent of the county as renewable energy space. Well, that's an interesting concept. So, <laughs> <clears throat> the next is the world's largest district heat pump is on show. This is really interesting to me. <clears throat> Located in the city of Drammen in Norway, it harvests heat it. from freezing water of a fjord and boosts it to 60 degrees for heat. 60 degrees Celsius. That's hot. I mean that. You don't want to come in contact, uh, 90 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, I'm reading this upside down. Oh, that's, a, that's almost boiling. Almost boiling, very close to boiling, for heating the buildings of the city. Yeah, here's, here's and this the... Is a, this is a, I think, I don't remember what it was in the, in the uh, article, but it seems to me that it's like 15 megawatts. This, this, this thing this grows. Is it's a pump. big deal. Oh, it's look at too, that thing. It's too big for the, wow. uh, for the picture. Too big for the picture. And big pump. I would imagine, to see if I get my mouse... That the, the height of a man is somewhere about here, I think. Okay. I'm kind of guessing, but I think it's about... Can you see it? I can't see it because I don't yeah, have my glasses on. Yeah, okay. there's the mouse. Now everybody knows what I look like with my glasses on. <laughs> there's the mouse right there. Yeah, I see it. Yep. This is a big plant. That's know? a big plant. And you can see handles and, and switches and uh, uh, so forth that they, and that they would use. I have no idea what all this equipment is, but let's see what it says. This is the largest natural fluid... District heat pump in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia. Uh, the natural fluid they're talking about is seawater. 
Yes. That's they're pumping the heat from cold from seawater. From cold seawater, freezing sea, or close to freezing seawater. And it's 14 megawatts. 14 megawatts, okay. Renewable district heating installation located in the city of Drammen in Norway. Yeah. It raises the, techno the, the technology bar to harvest heat from, from the freezing waters of the fjord and boost it to 90 degrees, just as you said, for heating the buildings of the city. Yeah. And they call this thing the neat pump. The neat pump? Yeah. Neat pump, okay. And there, the, the, the guy behind this article is pushing neat pumps in the UK. <laughs> yes. Uh, he's, I... he, <coughs> he, this is his quote. We believe sources of heat are widespread across Britain. We're talking geothermal sources. Well, this particular pump is getting it from water, and there is no place in Britain that is more than about 70 miles from some big body of water. Yeah, there's water. <laughs> it's everywhere. So, you know, it's surrounded <clears throat> by water. <laughs> it's surrounded by water. And, you know, most of their big cities are on large bodies of water, which is not unusual in this world. You know, most of the American large cities are most, also... Most of the big cities in the world are at or close to sea level. Yeah. Which is a very threatening thing if the waters rise. Yeah, it's kind of disconcerting to think about <laughs> global warming in those in those uh, in that context. It just happens that I, I put a quote down that I caught on the bottom of this page, and I'll read it. And you got to guess who said it. Okay. Up, I put my money on a sun and solar energy. What a power source! I hope we don't have to wait until oil and coal runs out before we tackle that. Who uh, said it, and when? Uh, I, I would ask the viewers to think about that because I happen to know. You know the answer. <laughs> I know the answer. Thomas Edison. Well, yep. Thomas Edison was talking with Henry Ford and Harvey Firestone in 1931. <laughs> I'm sure that Ford and Firestone were very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were all buddies. Yeah, they were. They, they but, used to go fishing together. As a matter of fact, they went fishing together without using bait. <laughs> okay. It was just an excuse to get out there in, a, in the middle of a boat and talk without anybody listening to them. Oh, my the, gosh. Oh, can you imagine such a thing? Yeah, as well, long as we're on that, this, okay. is, this is just a very pretty installation of a uh, vertical axis, an array of vertical axis turbines. On a roof. On top of a college in Melbourne, Australia. Cool. And that is the bottom of that picture is uh, some solar. Solar below it, yeah. This is the... And it must be really interesting to see those things going around. This is the six-star Daniel Mannix building in Melbourne. Wow. It's a prime example of sustainable infrastructure. Yeah. The solar panels and wind turbines on the building have saved over $35,000. I don't know if Australian dollars or American dollars. They're not that far apart. <laughs> I know it. At the Australian Catholic University in Melbourne. Wow. Okay. Well, let's go on. Next item is China's National Energy Administration announced it has set a 2014 goal <clears throat> of incentivizing, interesting word, 14 gigawatts of domestic solar capacity. I want to point out, this is PVs, I'm sure, not PVs and, and thermal. Mm -hmm. I, will, I will return we to talk this. To, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll return we'll to cover it. that later. Six gigawatts aimed at utility scale and eight gigawatts aimed at distributed distribution. Now, 14 gigawatts of solar... <clears throat> is, I'm going to say, roughly the equivalent of four nuclear power plants. It's probably more than that, or less. Well, less than that, do you think? Well, it's intermittent. Okay. It depends on whether you're talking peak or whether you're talking constant. Well, I think solar, you're going to be talking peak. Yeah. Um, that's one of the neat attributes about solar is it may be intermittent, but it always puts its power on the grid at precisely the same time of day that peak demand comes. And storage technology is improving daily. Yeah, but in the case of so solar, you really don't need solar storage technology. No, it technology. comes on at the time of day when power is most, most costly demanded, to generate. Yeah. Okay, uh, on the 22nd of February, we had a few things. This from Penn Energy. According to the latest energy inf infrastructure update report from FERC, 
I forget what FERC stands for. It's Fener Federal, Federal Energy, Energy Regulatory Committee. Committee. Or commission. Or commission. Okay. Like Non-hydro like renewable energy sources accounted for more than 99% of all new domestic electric generating capacity install, installed during January of 2014 for a total of 324 megawatts. 324, that's good, that's a clear amount. Yeah, more than 99%, this by is the way, non-hydro renewables. Non-hydro renewables, so it would be solar, wind, biomass, and, and uh, in geothermal. all of its many forms, and geothermal. And um, I, I need to point out again, geothermal does not mean in, in energy the same thing as geothermal at a house. It's a different thing. Um, but this, ha this has happened several times in the last year, there were three months last year where non-hydro uh, renewable energy uh, accounted for 99 or 100 percent of installation. And there was one month when 100 percent of the new power was from solar. Well, one of the reasons this is happening is you can install solar and even wind relatively quickly. Yeah. What you build a coal power plant or a nuclear plant, it takes years. It may take a decade. It takes years just to get the thing, just to get everybody's approval takes years. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, what's that plant? The TVA has been trying to build this plant since, like, I forget the year they started building it, but it was like 1978, and they're still building it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the name of the plant. It, it's one of those things. It goes forward, it goes backward. It goes forward, it goes backward. They try, they, they decide they're going to put it off. Okay, let's keep going. This is a cute one, and, I, and, and uh, this is the, the Guardian headline. Oh, I got that. You know that guy. one. You've I got, got a picture guy. of that. In fact, you've got a couple of pictures of that. <laughs> the Guardian has run an unprecedented banner headline in response to record-smashing deluges that have inundated the UK this winter. Climate change is here now. It could lead to global conflict, yet the politicians squabble. Well, <laughs> I got news for you. <laughs> They're right. Climate change is here now. That picture that you're looking at on a screen is the Thames River in a, in a flood stage. <sighs> look at it. Look at it. And the Queen's Archimedes screw turbines that are, that are powering Windsor Castle are not working because the water below them is too high. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> They're flooded, in other words. They're flooded. They mm -hmm. are. They are in trouble over there, and they've been in trouble all winter, from what I understand, with different kinds of po problems in Europe. Um, you had another one too, didn't you? Of the of the uh, Bloomsburg's. Uh, uh, cover? Uh, yeah, that's that's just a short one. I went by it already. Oh. I'll pull it up. I'll pull it up. we will pull it up. Let's be it's, patient. Let's be it's, patient. It's a. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> It's worth talking about. Yeah, it is. Ah, there it is. Yep. Yeah. It's global <laughs> warming, stupid. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. This, this, is the, this, is Bloomberg. this is Wall Street talking. This is Wall Street talking. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. And the guy next to it is a, is a story in itself. Yeah, uh, we'll get back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> he is, is an ExxonMobil CEO. The yes. ExxonMobil CEO. And you'll have a little bit to say I'll about I have a little him. bit to say about this guy. <laughs> okay. Um, despite new plants, nuclear future is still decades away. The Energy Department provided financing for the nation's first nuclear power plants in years, but a generation of new plants remains a long way off. And what's, what this is about is these um, small modular reactors. Um, those four scientists who said, in order to combat global warming, we need nuclear, we're mm -hmm. talking about the next generation. None of these plants has ever been built. Right, right. This the first one to come out in the United States is expected in the year 2022, and the second one, which is also in development, under development in 2025. And the problem that I see with these things is that... Um, from, from 2022, that first reactor is going to have to run for a couple of years before it can be generally licensed. They're going to have to have some experience with it. And then they're well, going to have to go through... It's kind of a pilot project. It's a pilot it? project, yeah. And, and then the next thing that they have to do 
is they have to get the individual reactors um, built and sited. Well, they have, to, they have to do the test, and then they have to get the approval, which I figure between the two of those, you're talking about five years anyway if they're racing through it. So you, you start on this thing in 2027, and then you're going to have to get it through siting as, on an individual basis, which is going to take a minimum of probably three years each. So we start in 2030, and in order to replace the current nuclear plants that we've got, these plants are about a third of the size. You're going to have to produce, put them online at a rate of 30 a year for 10 years to replace our current plants. Well, by the time this happens, renewables are going to be all over the place. We're not going to need them. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of the point. This is an interesting. Uh, it's on the same. Uh, yeah. It's on the same subject, really. Uh, this plant is uh, in Votel, Georgia. Yeah. And the Department of Energy has provided six and a half billion dollars in loan guarantees. Yeah. For these two, for two nuclear plants at this same site. Yeah. And I don't know what's going to happen. Well, we'll see. Maybe they'll finish those plants and maybe they'll say, why should we do this? It's too expensive. <laughs> yeah, they might. <clears throat> it's and too expensive. And here's another one on the same, so, similar subject. This particular plant is the Davis Best plant in Lake Erie. Yeah. And it's near Toledo. Yep. And I don't think it's that old. No. And the two original Certainly steam generators have to be replaced. Yeah. That's a typical kind of problem that you have. I think that they've been <clears throat> online something like 10 years. Was that Davis Bessie? Was that the one that, where they were having wear? No, there was one in, in Florida. Florida where they were having wear. wear. That's... Oh, man. Yeah. You know, it, it's like, what, do you, what would you do if you had a flat tire and it cost you $4,000 to replace? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is the, the mentality of the, well, I shouldn't say that really. And but I've got we, a quotation here. The anti-nuclear label is used to avoid the inconvenient truth about nuclear. It is and has been unable to compete economically with the alternatives available. I mean, there's, been, there's always been subsidies. Yes. And they deny that they're subsidies. Because the fact that they don't have to pay for insurance... That is a huge subsidy. ...is a huge <laughs> subsidy, but, you know... And the reason why they, they don't have to pay for it is they couldn't buy it. Well, the insurance industry can't afford to provide it, so... More importantly, it is not likely to be able to compete for the foreseeable future. Ever, I think, is reasonable. The, and this, this is relative to what you just said. The biggest mistake policymakers could make is to allow the search for yet another nuclear holy grail. That's what you're talking about. Well, that's what they're... To what delay they've done. the transition to a 21st century electricity grid. Yes. I and think this that's came from true. Forbes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. From Forbes? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, Wall, <coughs> Wall Street is taking a different look at these things. It, it is. It's all there's economic. No, there's no question about it. Wall Street is taking a different look. We have to keep going, though. We've got more news. On the 23rd, EIA's latest prediction is that about 60 gigawatts of coal will retire by 2016. And this is an increase in their expected amount from 40 gigawatts that, is predicted, that was predicted just last year and more than double the 27 gigawatts it predicted in 2012. In other words, we're shutting down nuclear uh, coal burning power plants, and by the way, nuclear too. But we're shutting down coal burning power plants, but they're ga they're going to have to be replaced faster than we can replace them with nuclear, and f even faster than we can replace them with with uh, gas powered plants. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that can replace these things that quickly is is solar and wind, solar as far as I know. And they're popping up. Everywhere. Wind all over the place. Yeah, everywhere. And uh, by the way, uh, don't be fooled. The cost of solar and wind is not greater than the alternatives. They are probably, they are among the cheapest resources we've got. Okay. That having been said, let's go on. And I will return to that if anybody wants me to. The government of the Indian state of Tamil Nadu 
and I'm undoubtedly pronouncing that wrong, but <laughs> you know, I just don't have an alternative, has drawn up an ambitious plan to generate 3,400 megawatts through solar energy, of which 700 megawatts of solar power units are expected to be commissioned this year. 3,400 megawatts. Yeah, that's, uh, you know. And this plant going up on Putney Road is 2 megawatts. Yeah. But they're, they're putting these 3,400 megawatts out in a place where they're, yeah. there just well, isn't anything going Indy's on. It is a big place. and it's They've got a lot of desert. I don't know what Tamil Nadu is like. I think it's in the south. But, you know. On the 24th, we got word that numerous in investors, including state government agencies, have filed shareholder resolutions with such fossil fuel companies as ExxonMobil and Chevron, seeking an explanation of their strategies for competing in a low-carbon global market. That's a problem that's just coming up and coming up and coming up. That came from a publication called Triple Pundit. This is, again, Wall Street coming down on the fossil fuel industry. And now we go back to that guy that we mentioned before. You, yeah, you can I'll, put him I'll up. Try and find him here. The rule of thumb, by the way, is never trust anybody with a crooked, crooked smile on face value. <laughs> <laughs> there, there he is. is. There okay, he is. I'll pull him up here. This is Rex Tillerson, and he is the C CEO of Exxon Mobil. And this is the way the news came out from Clean Technica. As Exxon Mobil's CEO, it is Rex Tillerson's job to promote the hydraulic fracturing enabling the recent oil and gas boom, which, by the way, is not going to continue, I don't think, and fight regulatory oversight. Nevertheless, he joined a lawsuit that cites fracking's consequences when it is near his home. Talk about a, oh well, <laughs> this is a NIMBY, you know, literally a NIMBY, not, not in my backyard. He's fighting fracking, not because it's inherently wrong or dangerous or there's bad science behind it. He says fracking is fine, but in his case, they want to have a water tower near his home, and there's going to be water being hauled all over the place, and there's going to be trucks going up and down the road, and that's going to be noisy, and he can't deal with that. Well, that makes sense. Everybody else should deal with it, yeah, because their property isn't <laughs> worth $5 million. But, okay. Well, was it F. Scott Fitzgerald? He said the rich are different from the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A report on Australia's liquid fuel security warns that a severely declining oil refinery, refining industry and increasing demand could result in a scenario in 2030, that's not that far away, where it has less than 20 days worth of fuel in reserve and a 100% level of imported liquid fuel dependency. Well, this, Australia doesn't have any oil, do they? Not a lot of oil. I don't know if they have any, yeah. to tell you the truth. Yeah. I think they've got to go to Indonesia for it. A lot in Indonesia. Yeah. But Indonesia, you know, who says Indonesia is going to continue selling oil? When, they, when their reserves start to run out, people are going to start looking out for themselves. Oh, I, that, that makes sense. And we've got, a, we've got a, an industry in, in uh, we've got a government in Australia that is De very heavily dependent on fossil fuels. So, with, and this from Renews, with right policy and regulatory support, the Beringia Report and Scottish Government analysis shows renewables in Orkney, Shetland, and the Western Isles can deliver up to 5% of Britain's electricity demand by 2030. Now, uh, these Or Orkneys, they're... they're Kind of far away, aren't they? Yeah, they're, they're well. It depends on what you call the, far away, but well, they're not adjacent to the coast of Scotland. Not, not they're, immediately. They're, it would, it would yeah. be a difficult project to get um, it, to get uh, electricity from Orkney to to the mainland. But for, but the rest of this Shetland, the Western Isles, they can do that more easily. Yeah, and, Shetland's closer. Yeah. If Scotland remains within the UK. I'm sorry, not Shep Shetland. I was thinking of the Western Isles. Shetland is farther up. Hebrides, the Hebrides are, yeah. are closer. But the, um, the getting up to 5% of Britain's electricity demand, this is not Scotland. 
This is Britain. This is, includes England and Wales and, yeah. and Northern Ireland, if you're willing to put Northern Ireland into Britain. And I know some Irish people who are not willing to do that. Well, it's not in Britain, but it's in Great Britain. That's, yes. Great Britain is a political yes. thing. It's and a, and is Cornwall is not part of England, according to people who live in Cornwall. Oh, you think, Doug? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Cornwall. It's Cornwall. And the Cornish are not English. They're different. I and that's what they tell you. I worked with a Cornish guy in Saudi Arabia, and his accent was, I enjoyed it. He talked, he sounded like a pirate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let's keep going. Interjex, Renewable Energy and Inc., has begun commercial operation of a 17.5 megawatt Northwest Stave River, run of the river hydroelectric facility. The facility is located in British Columbia, Canada. Now, this is run of river, and th the reason I've got this in here is because 17.5 megawatts is not huge, but it's appreciable. This particular thing is run of river, which means there is no dam. No dam. Right. All right. You can have a you can have a sort of a dam, but it's it's going to be low enough that that fish can you know having. They call that a weir. A low dam, yeah, yeah. is called a weir, and this may actually have something a little bit bigger than a well, weir, some, but something to provide a little bit of pressure behind. Yeah, there. a little bit, but you don't need a lot, and um, this is a there, you know there are. There are at least five different renew, uh, technologies that I know of that use hydro uh, power, six different, that um, don't require a dam. And so, you know, this is a, people should understand this. The fact that we're talking about hydro does not mean that we're talking about a dam. We're not unfortunately, talking about submerging cities anymore. Yeah, unfortunately, and this is one of the things that we'll be talking about n next week because James Perkins from Little Green Hydro is going to be here talking about laws in Vermont, possibly New Hampshire too. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our laws assume that there is going to be a dam. Mm -hmm. And so you can't do what these people are doing without, you know, you can't put in a $5,000 hydro system on your property without going through $30,000 worth of permitting, you know. Well, Pretty yeah, crazy. Is, they, they've got to take a new look at this kind of stuff because it's pretty crazy. Just like you say, you, you think hydro, you think dams, you think dispossessing, you think villages underneath the lake. Uh, yeah, going into uh, uh, the Quabbin Reservoir yeah. on a boat and looking down yeah, and seeing yeah. a church steeple down yeah, there. That, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And we don't need to do that anymore. As a matter of fact, we probably can't do that anymore. There are very few sites yeah. that are available for large dams, but we've got a lot of capability of putting in. Um, uh, smaller systems that don't have dams. And in the case of the thing that James Perkins is talking about, it doesn't even have a lot of water because he puts in things, he specializes in hydro facilities that have a very high head. Yeah. And he's got a system that draws the water in through a screen so that even the smallest fish and m many other aquatic creatures would not go into the system at all. It just can't get there. Mm -hmm. And a small amount of water goes into this thing. Most of the water from the stream continues down the stream, but 100 yards or 200 yards down the stream, it comes out through a turbine. So and he's diverting some of the water. He's diverting the just side a very small amount. Yeah, yeah, very small amount. And the system is built in such a way that if the stream gets low, the diversion of water stops. The electrical yeah, system yeah. goes off, but the, but the, 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 the stream itself remains protected. Well, I think you showed a picture of this. It's kind of an Archimedes screw thing, isn't it? Is no, that this is no. That isn't his. That's not his. The Archimedes okay. screw thing is the opposite. It's you need a lot of water. It okay. goes goes <laughs> down a small head, but you can run any kind of creature through that thing, and it'll come out unharmed come out at the, on the other, other end. Side, yeah. yeah, probably doesn't even notice in many cases that it's gone <laughs> through this thing. Okay, um, next on the twenty sixth, we have. Yet another nuclear uh, plant in Florida may be in trouble. More than 3,700 tubes that guy. help cool a nuclear reactor at Florida Power and Light's yeah. St. Lucie facility exhibit wear. Most That's other similar plants have between zero and a few hundred. And this was what closed down oh, the it. San Onofre plant in, yep. ca in California. And this thing at St. Lucie is 
a problem. I do have a picture of this. I'm and, trying to and, find it. And by the way, Florida Power and Light has found this problem, but they are persisting in trying to get an uprate at St. Lucie so it'll produce more power. And as a matter of fact, there's, the uprate was one of the problems. St. Lucie. Is that St. Lucie? That's just, this is St. Cool. Lucie. Cool. Let's look at St. Lucie. Up, oh, up. Oh. Got it? Got it. <laughs> okay. Now people can look at St. Lucie instead of me. <laughs> oh, oh uh, dear. And as, that, as you can that, see, there's, there's the, where, where the mouse is, it's the, the cooling water coming out of the nuclear station. Yeah. And I'm, this looks like water. Yes. I, I don't I I would understand what a lot of these things are. This is clearly an intake and a bypass because it goes back out to the sea over here. Yeah. And this stuff is going through the plant. Yeah. And these look like water of some sort, too. Yeah. People don't realize, you know, uh, nuclear plants are very inefficient. Um, if you ask a nuclear engineer how efficient his plant is, he's probably going to say 35% or 37% or 40% or something like that. And the, what that means is that if you take, if it's 35% efficient, that means that for every unit of energy they're putting on the grid, <clears throat> they're putting two into the atmosphere or into the water as heat. And there was an engineer at, at Vermont Yankee who told me that um, the waste heat from the Vermont Yankee plant, if you could just move it, um, would be enough to provide heat for every house in Vermont. In Vermont? In Vermont. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. But it's going into the Connecticut River or it's going into the atmosphere or something. And that's a problem. Here's now, it happens, that, it happens that that is uh, the efficiency of a thermal power plant. And that is cold, cold is the same, natural gas is the same. But in the case of a nuclear power plant, you, you only use about something less than 2% of the fuel to do that. So if you, look at the, if you look at the actual conversion of fuel into electricity, the efficiency is less than 1%. I said to him, <laughs> I said to him, no, that isn't what I mean. <laughs> what about how efficient you are in converging, con converting fuel into electricity? He said, I don't know. What, what do you mean? <laughs> when I explained it to him, he said, yeah, that could be. And that's one of the problems is that you... You have a small amount of use of the fuel, so there's a large amount of waste. Here's a little bit more about St. Lucie here. Oh, okay. Now, what it says that you already said, the Florida, yet another Florida nuclear plant may be in trouble. The cooling tubes show significant wear. There's 3,700 cooling tubes. That are wear, worn. That are, That's the number that are worn or dented. Well, it's more than 3,700 help cool a nuclear plant. Yeah. And they exhibit wear, yeah. Those, those are the wear. The, most other similar plants have between zero and a few hundred on yeah. a worn. Yeah. Worst case, a tube can burst and spew radioactive fuel. And they say that's what happened in San Onofre. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't spew radioactive fuel. It would, it, would, it would spew radiation, but not fuel. Thus, uh, the plant shut down forever because it was too careful. much to fix. You never can trust people in the press. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at that diagram there, if you look at the mouth, or you look at the cursor, there's a steam generator. Yes. And that steam generator takes the heat, the hot water that's in the reactor. Right. And it transfers that heat to other hot water. Right. And steam to right. turn turn the turbine. So, so they're trying to keep the radioactive water away from the turbine. Yeah. And they're not 100% they're not efficient in doing that. Yeah. There is some radiation in that yeah. water. But it's these tubes here that are wearing, and they're wearing very seriously. Yeah. And reading between the lines, uh, they're, really, they're going to be forced to close this place. Well, They're it, denying it, because this is what they say. Florida Power and Light is so confident in St. Lucie's condition that they're boosting power. Yes, well, we'll <laughs> see what happens. They acknowledge that it will aggravate the wear on the tubes located inside the, speed, the steam. Well, they, they know that it's going to aggravate the yeah. tube, the wear. That's what happened at Saint, San Onofre. They, they, they up, upgraded the plant, uprated the plant, put in new steam generators. It cost... 
hundreds of millions of dollars. My recollection is that it cost over a billion dollars. I might, it might even have cost two. But, you know, this business of steam generators and replacing them is extremely expensive. And of course, it's the it's the ratepayers or the taxpayers who pay for the pay for the for the changes, and there's just no way around that because if the you utility mean the investors don't pay. No, if the would you? <laughs> I wouldn't invest. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, then you don't have a problem with it. Well, uh, if it's one the, final but one if final it's the, comment on this, they talk about just after increasing the, the capacity, pressing. It's like pressing hard on the accelerator, even when you know the car has worn brakes. Yes. That's a good analogy. Yes, I think it is. I don't think Florida Power and Light would agree with you. I happen to agree with you. Okay. After years of predictions that China would begin investing more in a smart grid than the United States does... Bloomberg New Energy Finance has reported that China is investing $4.3 billion on smart grid invested. This is past tense. China invested more than $4.3 billion on a smart grid in 2013, far outpacing the U.S. spending of $3.6 billion in the same period. And you know, all things considered, it's not a surprise to me that the Chinese are pulling out ahead of the Americans in a bunch of respects because we've got investors who are interested in, in retaining their investment, and that's, that's where the bottom line is. And um, it's sad, but, you know. Well, smart grid technology is the way of the future. Yeah, I basically, have no doubt it's we, we now have the computing capacity. Yeah. Basically, to be aware of what's happening on the entire part of a grid. Yeah. Instantly. Yep. And to make adjustments. Yep. But we haven't hooked it up in such a way that it really works yet. Well, when we do, I think we're going to have huge benefits from it, uh, particularly if we can get people as we will, because uh, clearly out of the numbers, we get people to go to electric vehicles. We're going to have a lot, a lot of batteries out there. And the only thing is, I think we have to do it in, in a way which is intelligent so that the equipment that does it is protected from such things as solar storms. But um, it's, it, you, can, you can introduce huge efficiencies by having a smart grid. You can switch to renewables much easier if you've got a smart grid. And, um, and as more and more distributed sources get on, on the grid... Yeah. The smartness of the grid will be able to take care of these things. Yes. And some guy just turned on a huge air conditioner in an office building over here. And there's three or four guys over there with wind turbines kind of sitting there idly. Idling. And yeah. they connect them. Yeah. I mean, they're not directly connected. It's, you know, the electrons are going in over there. They're coming out over here. They're not the same electrons, but the electrons don't care. How do you know they're not the same <laughs> electrons? Well, some of them will be. <laughs> By, by I, I, just, I just love challenging me. <laughs> okay. Australia's largest, this is from Renew Economy, uh, Australia's largest renewables co company, Infigen, Infigen, yes, Infigen Energy, is confident the fixed renewable energy target of 41,000 gigawatt hours will remain in place, citing the emergence of sovereign risk among financiers and soaring domestic gas prices as the key arguments for its retention. Basically, what they're saying is that the government has got to get real and stop trying to ditch this thing because it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost fin the financial people too much money to ditch it. And, the, and the, government, yeah. the government has been playing into the interests of the fossil fuel industry, specifically the coal industry, because... They I don't have know, a lot of power in Australia. They have a lot of power. But, you know, even within the coal industry, you see people saying, no, we can't do that. Um, Someday in the future, they'll be using coal just for jewelry. <laughs> yes. And it'll be highly priced. <laughs> I'm sure that's the case, Tom. You remind me of, of, an, of an article that was in the, in the Wall Street Journal, and I think it was in uh, the winter of... 1964 to 65 or something like that, in which somebody at GE was, was showing off a, a new machine they had that produced pressure. 
And the way they showed it off was by putting a dab of peanut butter on something and putting it through the machine, and it came out as a diamond at the other end. <laughs> yeah, I remember a guy in my class was absolutely convinced that the price of di diamonds was going to go through the floor because you could make diamonds out of peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what the full implications are of this, but it is factual that General Electric is a member of the International Diamond Cartel. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, and now we're up to the 27th of February, which is today, I think, isn't it? All day. All day, okay. Research from Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California in San Diego now shows the impact of melting Arctic ice, sea ice, on global warming is likely to have been significantly underestimated. That is not good news. It just brings the tipping point closer. Uh, well, I'm not convinced about this tipping point thing. Um, I think that the whole thing is, I, I think that they exist, but I think that, I, I don't know that the tipping point is something that we can't do in reverse. We can't, once over it, we can't back over it again later. I hope you're right. Well? <laughs> I, I don't know either. I don't know, but I'm, I am profoundly uh, hopeful that we're going to be able to get a handle on global warming. It's just a question of is it going to be difficult and costly and painful, or is it going to be fun? Because I think if we go into this global warming thing saying, yeah, we're going to do this, it is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. And I do think that 100 years from now, if we approach this in, from the proper point of view, people are going to be healthier and happier than they are now. Well, I certainly think that's a possible outcome. We're not going to have to change. We're going to have to change a lot change of things, lot of things but we're not going to be breathing fumes from from global warming. I came across some some stuff um, uh, uh, from uh, oh Benjamin Sovacool, who is an adjunct professor at the university at the Vermont Law School. I've he's, heard the name. Yeah. He's also in, he 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 globe trots. I think he's yeah. all over the place, but he has done what are called meta-studies, where he just grabs information from a bunch of studies, looks at the studies, say, can we believe this? Takes the ones that he feels we can believe, puts them together, does a big thing, studying the whole thing. And he, he did this, um, a very nice one, on the carbon footprints of nuclear power. And then he did another one on um, wind turbines and, and avian death from wind mm -hmm. turbines. So the question is, what kind of damage do they do in terms of killing birds? It's really easy to see. You know, the blade goes around. Mm -hmm. It's easy to picture that blade hitting a bird. But what you don't picture is ways that birds die in, in other facilities. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, when I started reading the, the analysis, I was surprised to see that there were significant bird deaths from hydro. How do you get bird deaths from hydro? Well, they must be water, water birds. I don't know that, but I, that's what I assumed too. Um, but they said deaths from nuclear for birds. And the, the um, meta-analysis that, that Benjamin Sovacool did provided an amount of the number for the, for the deaths from from wind, far, wind and mm -hmm. from nuclear. Mm -hmm. And his number that he got from these studies was that nuclear produces about 50% more deaths per megawatt hour produced than wind, wind does. Now that's not per capacity, that's actually for the amount of... Per time. The amount of power that's put on the grid, you get more deaths from uh, bird deaths than you do from uh, you, what's, from what, what, what's the mechanism? Here? I'm going to guess that it's mine trailings. Ah, yeah, you don't even think about that stuff. You, it's so far in the past. Yeah, you don't and then think about it. and then he said the number of deaths per megawatt hour, or per gigawatt hour, or whatever, from fossil fuels is 19 times as great as it is from wind turbines. So for for on a per megawatt hour. If we put up wind turbines and replaced all of our fossil fuels with wind turbines, 
we'd fewer have birds we'd have far fewer bird deaths. <laughs> but on top of that, one thing that they don't even talk about, I, Sovacool I think could have talked about, but most of the most of the because he's a very bright guy. But most of the of the of the studies they probably don't talk about this. When a when a wind turbine kills a bird, it's an impact. The bird either lives or it dies. Wow. It's it's, it's yeah it's yeah. it's whacked. If it's in flight and it's whacked and it isn't killed, it's going to die because it hits the ground. Yeah. Okay. Fossil fuels. Nineteen times as many birds die. But they die of slow death. They die of poisoning. Yeah. What percentage of the birds that we have are being poisoned, and there's an effect on their health? And my guess is it's close to a hundred percent of the birds are being poisoned to some degree, and human beings as well. You know, this is something we've got to take these things in, in, in some sort of context. We can't just stop putting in wind turbines because they kill birds. We, I think it's just a red herring. It, I think it is too, to <laughs> tell you the truth. This is, this is sort of pertinent. I don't think we talked about this on the air. This is the uh, Ivan Pa. Uh, I, I, I pronounce it Ivan Pa, but Ivan I don't Pa. know that you're not right. I don't, I don't know either. I yeah. don't. Just in case people want to know, you know, <laughs> we, we pronounce it two ways so that everybody I'm gonna, I'm is accommodated. I'm going to pull it up on a screen here. I think that's this, a good this idea. This is right outside of Death Valley. It's a beautiful place. It's totally desert. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are some places being built up near here. And this place is huge. It's huge. And why, Is I'm that looking, up on the screen? It, oh, I thought it... it I, thought I it think was, it's the big it's one that you get. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pushing we don't know what we're doing. Why would, we, why would you think we know what we're doing? <laughs> <laughs> this thing is huge. Yes, it's huge. <laughs> we, we've talked about it a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, but why it happened to be up this week was uh, it officially opened for business a couple of days ago. One of the owners is Google. Yes. Uh, the so, way the plant scorches birds is horrifying. This is the article. Yes. And apparently birds are getting burnt by this thing. Yeah. And are you ready for this? The number of birds. What did I drop here? I think that was that thing right there. No, we don't need that. Yeah. The number, this is horrifying. Yeah. Are you ready for this? Yeah. The number of birds killed by this is 11 birds a month. Horrifying. <laughs> And it says that's a drop in the bucket compared to the number of birds killed by other forms of human structure. You know, I have seen water birds land in chemical ponds at chemical plants. Oh, wow. Yeah. It is absolutely disgusting. You, you, we, we have all seen pictures of birds that have, have got into oil spills. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thousands of birds, not just thousands, millions of birds. And I feel sorry for the 11 birds a month that die, die at Ivanpah. But if it's 11 birds a month as opposed to the, whatever would be killed by fossil fuels, it's a huge improvement. And we should try to get it down to zero. Really. We yeah, should think we should. about that. Uh, but, uh, just put it in perspective, I would imagine cats in Brattleboro kill 11 birds a month. My cat kills 11 <laughs> birds a month. <laughs> And this article says it's a drop in the bucket compared to the number of birds killed by other forms of human infrastructure. An estimated minimum of 300 million birds a year are killed simply by colliding into buildings. Yeah, and, and that's a low number compared to the number of ca uh, cat, birds killed by cats, which can run into many billions. Now, as long as we got this up on the screen, let's look at a couple of other things about it. Uh, it's, it's three... Three units of power, three power units. You can see all three in this picture. Yep, three towers. Built on approximately 3,500 acres. That's about, a, I think, about a third the size of Brattleboro. Okay. Okay. 3,500 acres, I guess. I'm going to guess is about five square miles. Probably about that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so here's, here's on the left is a aerial view of that power, of that power plant. Yeah. You can see the three... Uh, Three towers. Yeah, okay. which would probably be five miles by one mile. Yeah. If you're looking at where the mouse is there, or where the cursor is, that's that's those mountains you see in there. Yep. Now over here on the right is a funny looking structure there. <laughs> it's a golf course. Yeah. <laughs> so each of these is as big as a golf course. Yeah. And over on the right, you can see where it is. Uh, it's right on the border of Las Vegas. Of, 
Arizona, or Arizona? Yeah, Nevada. Nevada. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's Las Vegas. These green things aren't green. They just happen to be state parks. Yep. State forests. They're, all of this is Death Valley kind of desert. And it's really beautiful, spectacularly beautiful. And with the exception of a few uh, golf courses here and there, it's totally undeveloped. Yeah. Uh, the town of Barstow is over here, oh, in yes. the lower left corner. Yeah. Uh, Steinbeck wrote a lot of uh, stuff about the Okies and Barstow, and that's kind of their first stop on the way west. Okay. And then over here is Lake Havasu City, which they're developing. And here's on the right is Lake Mead. That's where uh, Boulder Dam is. Yep. Huge, huge uh, hydro plant. Yep. Very high dam. Hmm? Very, Very high, high dam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the end of that. So I'll turn it back over okay. to you here. We've got two more items, and both of them are important. One thing we did not see, this is, these are both from the Energy Collective. One thing we did not see prominently in the news was that in 2013, China installed about 40 gigawatts of solar water heating capacity. You see solar hot water can be quite boring, but it has it, but it still owns solar power in terms of installed capacity, and China has the most. 40 gigawatts of, of, of power, that's a huge amount of power. I don't know how much it is, but I would bet that they installed in one year as much solar power as the United States and Germany have combined in, PV, PC, in, in PVs. 40 gigawatts is, of solar power is about the, of, is about the equivalent of, t of 10 nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. And so, they're, and of course, they're just using this for heating water, but they may be using it, they may be using that industrially. But they, they, they know, might be, yeah. They, they know they've got a problem with coal, and they've got to get rid of that coal. They're still building coal plants. But that's the complexities of the Chinese economic system. Well, solar hot water has been popular in Vermont for a long time. It's the kind of thing you can bake it, bake, if you're relatively capable, you can make it yourself. Well, yeah, but you know, there's something that's been pointed out to me by people who work in solar. And I forget who f pointed this out to me first. Um, but it might have been Peter Thorell at, at uh, Sovereign, but it, it's somebody. In, in the solar industry pointed out that um, it, it, it has got to a point now with PVs that it may be cheaper and is certainly easier to put in solar PVs and then heat water electrically using the power from the PVs than it is to put in solar hot water in many places. Because the hot water, you need to plumb. You ha it may, if it goes on the roof, it's heavy. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things about solar hot water, but one of them, as you pointed out, if you're a bright fellow, you can do it by yourself, mm -hmm. and you can do it entirely by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you take a an old uh, an old um, uh, 55 gallon drum, which is painted black, and use that as a as a heating place. Maybe reflect a little light onto it, and it'll heat the water up in the sun. No, well, that's that, that actually works. It's a batch I mean. heater, and it's not it's not the the not the most elegant thing in the world, and it's not the most efficient either. But yeah, you can make well, you it work. You can drive around. You see solar hot water on, on people's well, roofs. I've been thinking about putting it on a lawn, mm -hmm. and then, and then as opposed to up on the roof, mm -hmm. and then piping the power to water storage in the basement, mm -hmm. um, and then using that to, to distribute heat into the house. And I so you could heat the house with you it. You could heat the house and with it. Yeah. Take your baths in. You, well, yeah, assuming that it's ho he hooked up to the hot water system. Yeah. But I was thinking of just putting it into the basement and then piping and just this water through the house. There, there's piping a, it like through radiators. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I'll tell you this one because it's, it, it's, I, I, it's personal. Okay. Uh, SIT. Yes. Uh, had been playing around with solar heating. Yes. And this class that was working on it, I guess, graduated and people kind of forgot it. But one of the buildings there had a solar solar room added to it. Oh, okay. And it was also a vegetable growing room. Oh, okay. And basically it was a room maybe 10 by 20. 
Okay. Attached to the side of one of the dorms okay. facing south. Yeah. Uh, in it, they had a whole bunch of 55-gallon drums painted yes. black. Yes, yes. And on top of that, they had rectangular boxes that were raised bed growing things. Yes. And the heat, the, the heat came in from the sun. Yes. It heated the water. The water was a heat sink. It just kept it there, kept the room. Right. And they grew vegetables there, which we ate in the dining hall. Cool. And in addition, there was a couple of just simple flaps of plastic that if the room got hot enough, these flaps of plastic opened up and the hot air went into the dorm. Ah. Now, it didn't heat the dorm. It contributed to the It contributed to the, to the heat, which cut now, the costs. I and this remember is... being in that room. It was a, a day like today. It was like 17 degrees out. Mm -hmm. And it was about 80 degrees in that room. <laughs> yes, it's not hard to do that. Yeah. And I've seen that, you know, at the greenhouse that we have at our place. The, the, uh, the, my landlord and I have a, she, she calls herself a landlord. I call her a landlady. But <laughs> while I'm on television, I will call her a landlord. She, she and I kind of share a greenhouse. And, you know, the temperature in the greenhouse, even on a day like today, except it's got to be sunny, and I don't know what today is. I've forgotten. Um, the temperature can get quite warm in the winter. Yeah. Really warm. There's a lot of sun in the, a lot of heat in the sun. All right. One more item. Uh -huh. Advanced Energy Economy has released, has released a, a report, this is an organization, finding that the global advanced energy economy, which includes efficient transport, biofuels, commercial and industrial efficiency, and clean energy elect, uh, generation, was valued at $1.1 trillion in 2013. Now, Advanced Energy Economy is, a, is an organization which comes from Wall Street. It's a, it's a, a um, it, it's, it, it, it was put up by people who were financial. In particular, one fellow, and I've forgotten who it was, but he was a billionaire who, who wanted to have a research institute for this kind of thing. And what they're, what they're coming up with is that the amount of money being invested and the amount of money being produced in energy efficiency and renewable energy is huge. And it's just getting bigger. So there it is. Now, um, I think we're drawing to the end of our hour. Kind of looks like it. It does. So I think we're at a point where it would make sense for us to say goodbye to those people who get onto this from BCTV or other stations, because I know that we're, n we're now going to other stations, um, on a broadcast or cable cast system. And we will be back next week with uh, our guest, James Perkins, who's going to talk about microhydro, which does not require dams. I want to put this picture up on the screen. I just like, like this picture. These kids yeah. look so damn happy. They do. Yeah, <laughs> they do. It reminds me of those stories that I've heard about villages in India that got their first power because somebody brought in like a, uh, a uh, cell phone tower operator brought in a uh, uh, f uh, PV system in order to power the tower, and they're selling excess power to the villagers. And it's the first electric power they've ever had. Mm -hmm. And these people are saying, we've got a light bulb. Mm -hmm. You know, we take it for granted so much in this country. And here are people who are, you know, they, their kids go to universities and become lawyers and things like that. Not as commonly, perhaps, as rich kids, but these are, these are people who have, have their traditions and their future and their hopes and their desires and their wishes and, their, and one of the things that they rejoice over is we've got a light bulb or we've got a fan. Yeah. I've got a yeah. fan. Yeah. I can cook under an electric light and my son can use it for studying his, his uh, ex high school exam so that he can go, go to college. And it's a different world and those kids, they did look like they were having a good time. And of course, those that 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 PV system is um, is. Uh, I'll pull it up again. Yeah, that PV system is not going to poison them. It's not going to smoke. You know, the number of people who die worldwide because of indoor fires is extraordinarily high. It's 
it's it's like four hundred thousand women die every year tending fires inside the house because oh, of carbon monoxide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And, the, and the lung disease is just from cooking, cooking in your in your house. Yes, because the fires are not vented. They don't mm -hmm. have chimneys to vent these things, so they depend on an open window. You know, um, looking at the the structure of this uh, PV system, it's really quite simple. It looks like it was made with. Uh, Plumbing pipe and tuba force. Yeah, it very likely is. You know, which, which, why not? Yeah, why not? All they need to, all they need to provide power. A lot of these things, you know, all they need to provide power all night is a battery because they don't have a huge demand in the village. They, they, they are living a fairly simple life, and um, there isn't a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, demand on, on the. On the pe for, by the people in the village to get power or to get a lot of other things too, and um, you know. Well, before PV, a lot of these villages had some sort of limited amount of power, usually diesel. Yeah. Which maybe only ran for a couple of hours a day. Or they had nothing at all. Or they had nothing. A at third all. of the of the population of India, as I, as I recall, or maybe it's a quarter now, is is without any electricity. This is Africa. It's probably worse, yeah. worse numbers than India. Yeah, and a lot of places, diesel power is the only power you can get because, you know, a lot of uh, there, a lot of people live on islands, and the, the any power that they get is going to have to be imported, unless they can produce it themselves, which they can with PVs. And in some places, they can they can do it with food waste or agricultural waste, um, for example, uh, oils. That are that are from food, or waste from agricultural production, such as the hulls of coconuts and things like mm -hmm. that. Sugar cane baguette. Yes, right. And that's that is stuff which in the past had been had been waste that was generating problems. Yeah. And now they had to dispose of it. Yeah, they had to dispose of it. And now a lot of the stuff, food waste, manure from animals. Human waste for, uh, and so forth can all be used as biomass and used to generate um, methane, which which can be used to generate electricity. And we're doing a lot of that in Vermont. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, we're yeah. doing a lot, and we should be doing more. It's cow a, power. Cow power. It's very very clean, and it's carbon neutral, and it's a it's a really good way to get power, and it should be done really. I think in every every community that has a community. Um, uh, municip municipal waste system should be should be using you, that system. Well, right now their landfills are disappearing in Vermont. I know that we're, we're taking some of our garbage and bringing it up to New York State. Yes, which I think is ridiculous. Well, it costs a lot, and <laughs> yeah. it, co it means trucking. We're trucking the stuff out. We're there, trucking the waste, and we have to deal with that as well. In in nature, there is no waste. Whatever there is in nature, something eats it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to start doing that. You know, I was reading about about aquaculture going on in in um, China. There's aquaculture going on in the United States, and there's a system called aquaponics, where the waste from the fish, yeah. all right, is and is is being converted in the system into um, Basically, what ha the, the big problem w with fish is not that they poop in the water. The big problem is that they're constantly emitting urine. Yeah, and the Which urine, is a fertilizer. It, it's great fertilizer if it's treated properly, but if the fish sit there bathing in the urine, they wind up getting <laughs> <Dead>. very sick, <laughs> dying. But what happens is you take this fish water and you put it into a, a, a system, which can be very simple. Um, you can just go from the fish water to a system where it's it's exposed to the roots of plants, but basically what happens is the roots of the plants, or or you might have a tank where that is devoted to the water goes into that tank, and there are, there is a accommodation for bacteria in that tank to convert the urine into nitrates, mm -hmm. and it goes through a fairly lengthy process that that involves going from ammonia, urine to ammonia, from ammonia to nitrites from nitrites to nitrates, and then back to the plants. But you can do it just by using the plants. And in fact, you can do this by putting the plants into the fish tank, mm -hmm. if you're willing to have a lot of water <laughs> and very few fish. 
But the, the, the thing is, you can take that system and you can take the waste from the fish and, and run it through a system that makes nitrates and then put it across the roots of plants in a hydroponic system where the plants are not growing in, in uh, soil. They're growing in some other kind of medium, such as expanded shale or, or you know, something like that, uh, clay pellets, mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And it goes gravel through... Gravel, in effect. Gravel, in effect, but light gravel. And then it goes from that back into the fish tank. So the plants are, are collecting the what the, would have been a problem for the fish. Of course, this is the way fish live in nature. But it goes around in a circle. You, if you have a sophisticated system where things are being monitored, and you can actually raise a lot of fish for food. And then you're also raising plants. So you can raise a lot of plants for food. And this is what's called aquaponics. And I have read, I haven't done it, so I you know, can't really comment all that much, but I, be, I believe what I've read about this. You can get 20,000 pounds of fish, and in a lighted greenhouse where you're providing electric lights, you can get 40,000 pounds of vegetables per acre per year. Mm -hmm. So that's 60,000 pounds of food per acre per year. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> basically, it's a, it's, it, it's a renewable system. You have food going in. Um, and the food going in is fish food of some kind, but there are many ways of raising this. You know, for example, and I wouldn't recommend that everybody do this at home, but you can you can raise um, you can raise uh, mosquito larvae mm -hmm. in water that was is part of the system, mm -hmm. and then divert the mosquito mm -hmm. larvae into the fish, and the fish eat them. And you, if you do it properly, you don't have any mosquitoes; they just come and lay their <laughs> eggs. <laughs> Another one that's really cute, there's, a, there's, an, there's an animal called a black soldier fly, which looks a little bit more like a wasp than a fly, but it, it, it is a fly. It's not the kind of fly that people get into their houses at all, um, but it has some really kind of endearing characteristics. It doesn't bite people. It doesn't spread diseases. What it does is it gets into your compost and it lays eggs there. And if the compost is damp enough, the black soldier fly larvae will go through the compost and eat until they're big enough that they can, that they can pupate. And so what they do at that point is they look for, they're in a, they're in a damp enough environment, they're, they start looking for a dry environment mm -hmm. so that they can make cocoons or go do their, their pupil stage. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they start to climb. So if you've got like a board or something going up the side of the compost thing, and which may be plastic that they can't climb, they will start climbing that board. Mm -hmm. And they'll climb up the board until they get to the top, and they'll keep right on going, and they'll fall into a bucket. <laughs> <laughs> now, black soldier flies lay their eggs wherever they can smell that there are black soldier fly larvae. So if you've got black soldier fly larvae, Black soldier flies are going to come and they're going to lay eggs in your compost. Uh -huh. All right? Every, whenever, <laughs> every day, whatever, you take that bucket and you empty it, <clears throat> the larvae, into your fish tank. Fish and the fish come and eat it. <laughs> and, you know, there are many, many things that you can do like this. You can raise crickets and you can feed the young crickets to the fish. Raising crickets is not that big a deal, and you can you just feed them um, vegetables. And by the way, I had a, an acquaintance who went to, um, went to uh, Thailand. I love Thai food. Mm -hmm. I asked him about <coughs> Thai food in Thailand. There used to be a, a Thai restaurant in Massachusetts that was so good, it was unbelievable. People would drive 50 miles just to go to this little shack that you couldn't even sit down inside of. They had a picnic table outside. And the food was just marvelous, and the best thing was pad thai. And I asked him about pad thai, and he said, well, the pad thai is good in some places, not as good in others. It's always kind of okay, but it's, you know, it's, there's a lot of variation. And he said there was one dish that they always had everywhere, and everywhere it was delicious. It was uniformly wonderful and that was fried crickets. Hmm. Now, I will point out to those who think that crickets are 
the idea of eating crickets are dis is disgusting. The Bible says that they're kosher. Does it really? <laughs> <laughs> so we've got that as a start in its favor. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, I, I, I've never tried crickets. I'd be very happy to try crickets. Mm -hmm. And I'm certain that somebody is going to call, you, you know, send me an invitation that says, George, you've got to come and eat these crickets because we want to see if you're really willing to do it. Yeah, we eat shrimp. We eat shrimp, that's right. And crickets are just, well, there are other things that we could eat. I'm told that roly-polies taste like shrimp. What? Those little pill bugs that you find under boards that are left in the grass oh, or yeah, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's two different kinds. Uh -huh. One of them is a roly-poly and the uh -huh. other is not. My understanding is that the roly-polies taste like shrimp, to which they are closely related, and the other ones taste like gasoline. <laughs> <laughs> but you can tell the difference because the roly-polies roll up into little balls mm -hmm. when they're scared, and the other ones don't. And the other ones also <laughs> smell like gasoline. At least that's what I've been told. Yeah. There are freshwater shrimp. Yes. And the freshwater shrimp can be raised and fed to the fish. There are things called hyalella and, and gamorous, which are little things that are kind of shrimp-like but smaller. Some of them are, you know, only, only a quarter of an inch long. But the fish will eat them, and you can feed them uh, fallen leaves. Wow. And this is not difficult. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you could do in Vermont, and I've been... Obviously, I've been studying this. Tilapia is a great fish, mm -hmm. but it requires heat. You mm -hmm. cannot it's raise tilapia in, yeah. Yeah, in, the, in the, it, it, the, the, the most cold-tolerant tilapia will die at 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. But there are other fish, and, and brown bullheads, catfish, mm -hmm. which are native to Vermont mm -hmm. and abundant in mm -hmm. Vermont, are one of the fish that I think could be raised for food, in the type of setup that I've described. And, and they're I've, tasty. They're very tasty, yeah. yeah. Or at least so I'm told. Um, I've had catfish, yeah. I've had catfish, but I don't know that it was brown bullhead. Okay, uh, I probably The brown bullheads, bullhead. you know, they're not they're all that big. They, you yeah, know. I used to catch them when I was a kid. Okay. Um, and I've thought about the idea of feeding brown bullheads kitchen waste. Uh -huh. You know, and just saying, okay, there it is. And the other thing, too, of course, is... Um, a crayfish. Mm -hmm. If you don't mm -hmm. want to eat them yourself, you can feed mm -hmm. them to your fish, and those bull brown bullheads will eat them. Mm -hmm. They'll also eat clams and and uh, <laughs> things like that. The if you if you go out in the Connecticut River and you disturb the bottom, mm -hmm. you will. Which I do not recommend you do because you may be breaking laws by doing this. But if you did, you would find a lot of freshwater uh, mussels, which are in fact not mussels; they're clams, but they are freshwater. Mollusks mm -hmm. that, and the and the brown bullheads will eat those when mm -hmm. they're small enough, and um, they're they're uh, kind of voracious fish. But my suspicion is that they would eat bits of hot dogs and and things like that. If, Probably kitchen waste. They, I would they, think that they I, would I eat doubt, kitchen waste. I doubt they're picky eaters. I don't think they are, and I've thought of you know lowering into a, a batch of brown bullheads. Um, kitchen waste that was that was in a thing that would that would look like a well it would be a, it would be basically a net mm -hmm. and then it opens mm -hmm. underwater and then leave it there for a day or two and then bring it out again so it can go into the compost because they'll eat what they want mm -hmm. and they won't eat what they don't mm -hmm. want and that's that mm -hmm. but you've got to make sure that you've got a big enough container for them they're not easy to breed I'm told uh, at least not on an amateur basis, but I, you know, I, people want to raise trout. They're accustomed to trout. Trout is not the best fish to raise, I don't mm -hmm. think. Um, they. If it was, more people would be doing it. Well, they they need cold water. Mm -hmm. um, cold water in a greenhouse is much more difficult than cold water in a pond, mm -hmm. uh, or or more to the point, a stream. And the. Uh, there are there are a, there are a, a bunch of um, of reasons why I think, but I I, I think I think trout are good because they're native. Um, tilapia are not native, but we don't have to worry about them escaping, because they're not going to survive in the wild. Mm -hmm. But um, good point. 
Yeah. It really, it really is uh, a good point. There is a lot of stuff that you have to think about when you're thinking about what species to raise. Another species that we're talking about raising is um, golden shiners. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with them? Not really. All right. They're, they're minnows, and they're used for bait. Okay. You can buy them at bait farms, and they're usually so badly stressed, uh, you know, at a bait dealer, that um, if you buy them and try to keep them, they'll just die. Yeah. Uh, fathead minnows have a better chance, but fathead minnows, you know, two and a half, three inches is about as big as they're going to get. Golden shiners will grow up to 14 inches in nature. But, you know, one of the things that we talk about is the idea of a freshwater sardine. Mm -hmm. Okay? And a, a golden shiner, which grows to be four inches long commonly and will reproduce at that, at that size or even smaller, you can breed these things yourself. It, it, there is a problem that you need to have a license if you're going to be breeding fish that could be used for bait. Mm -hmm. But it's not an expensive license and it's not a difficult license. It's a cheap license. Um, but you could have the golden shiner um, raised and then, and then at, a, at a certain point take them and use them for, for food. Have a lot of them. You have, you have small fish, but they're treated like sardines. I have been told, and I haven't actually tried it, so I can't say from first-hand experience that these fish are quite delicious. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's another possibility. I think that if we were to go yeah, into... Yeah, you eat the bones at all. You, yeah, with yeah. a golden shiner, if it's small enough. As a matter of fact, there is a tradition that exists in the UK and in many other countries, Spain and so forth, but it is in the UK, it is in, in, in New Zealand, it is in Australia, and there's no reason why we couldn't do it here, of eating the whole fish. Head and all. Head and all. Mm -hmm. And you do this with fish that are small, one to two inches, and the fish are referred to as white bait. They are not necessarily white, and they are certainly not bait. But <laughs> there, what you do is you take the fish, you put it in a holding tank where it is deprived of food for a day, so you, the intestines are flushed out, and you... Um, you take it at that point and however you're going to euthanize this thing, you do it. I don't like the idea of letting them gasp to death. In, in, but, you know, that's because I'm a soft-hearted and soft-headed individual. But hit them with a hammer. Hit them with a hammer. You can put them on a tray and put them in the freezer and they'll be dead in a couple of minutes. Um, the, you take the, the fish that have, have you know, their... their um, Poop, pooped out of them, and you um, can put those into batter and and fry them, or you can put them into fritters. And they are uh, the white bait. There, people love them, and they eat them like like uh, French fries. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a good source of protein. Mm -hmm. um, it may be fatty, but it's a good source of protein. We've got potentials for food. I'm convinced we could more than feed the world. We've got to stop the world from reproducing, but that's a separate <laughs> that's story. That's a different issue. But we, we could feed the world. and just With just a slight lateral step. With just a slight lateral step. Yeah. And what you were talking about, if there's something out there, somebody eats it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the thing in China, and of course this is ancient culture, uh, because they've been doing aquaculture for centuries, millennia, the 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 chicken waste and the and the and the manure from the pigs and so forth is dumped into a pond, mm -hmm. where it is eaten by a fish, mm -hmm. which is then eaten by the farmer. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, there may be people who think that's not very nice, but the fact of the matter is, most fish will. I shouldn't say most most fish. Many fish will eat the the poop that other fish poop. Mm -hmm. And some of them will say, that doesn't taste very good, and spit it out. But others will just take it and eat it. And the, the reason this happens is because these are cold-blooded animals, and their intestinal systems are not um, very efficient. So the waste that comes out is full of nutrition. Mm -hmm. all right? If you think about the waste from horses or cattle, the waste that comes out is full of nutrition. <coughs> You put it into a, into a biodigester, and it feeds lots of bacteria. But if you don't put it into a biodigester, 
other things will come along. And, you know, one of the things that in, a, in an area where there in the past were a lot of horses, you'd see sparrows or things mm -hmm. of that nature mm -hmm. picking at the, mm -hmm. at the horse manure because there'd be seeds in there seeds that are sure. undigested. Yeah. And um, that's basically what happens with a fish. Down at the bottom of the fish tank, down at the bottom of the pond, you have fish like catfish. Yeah, bottom who, feeders. Who yeah. are bottom feeders. You can have three levels of fish in a pond that they don't interfere with each other. Yeah, and you have fish at one level that don't interfere with each other. Yeah. That happens very commonly. You have many, many different kinds of fish. Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You have a bottom feeder, a top feeder, or something feeds in the middle. Yeah, and something that feeds everywhere. So, well, I guess that would be the one in the middle, yeah. Well, I think there are ones <laughs> that only fit in, feed in the middle. It's, yeah, it, it's a very complex yeah. sort of thing, and there have been a lot of people who have done a lot of work on it. But, you know, my vision for what the world is going to look like um, 150 or 200 years from now, I, honestly, I think most people are going to be doing their own gardening. And they will be doing that gardening. In some form. In some form. Yeah, it's going it, to be very different from your backyard garden today. Yeah, but it will happen in, with, with not just plants, but animals as well. Well, it makes a lot of sense. I, I know when I was at SIT, my group got into a module where we did study agriculture, aquaculture, aquaculture combined. Okay. Uh, and I do remember one model farm that we kind of liked. Uh, it was really going on. This kind of this model was being practiced in parts of China. And you had, let's say, an acre of land. Mm -hmm. right, maybe five acres. It doesn't matter. You a small plot of land. And it was divided into four, basically. Okay. And there was a building in the middle. And each of the four was rotated around every year in a different kind of crop. And one of those four quadrants was always flooded, and it was fishing it. Huh. And the building in the middle, in addition to the place for the farmers to keep their implements and stuff, it uh, had, uh, the roof was kind of chicken wire, and it had chickens up there. <laughs> and in the bottom was pigs, and then around it was three different growing crops okay. and a lake, okay, which rotated once a year. And the fish would do their thing in the water, and then that would be the beginning of the next year's fertile agriculture. Interesting. And then maybe they plant legumes in one and then grains in another. I don't remember the, the, the rotation, but it was, they had been doing this for hundreds of years, so they, they had it down pat. Yeah. You know, and it was sort of like uh, the stockyards. Everything, they, they, they wasted nothing but the squeal. Yes. You know, it was really it was an, an interesting concept. That is interesting. They had something like that, a demonstration going on at the New Alchemy Institute down at Cape Cod. Yeah. Which we went down there and visited as a class thing. And that yes. was a fascinating place. It was. It's a shame it's gone. It is indeed. That was, uh, you know, it was a, I used to live not very far from there. I lived in Plymouth. Okay. And then I, I moved to another place in um, Kingston, which is just the next town north. But my kids and I would go down to New Alchemy. Mm -hmm. And the last time we went down was a week after they had decided to shut down. And the story that I heard about that shutting down was really tragic. Um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, they decided they were going to shut down. And the staff knew that there were some financial problems and the board was meeting over these financial problems and so forth. They didn't know that anybody was even going to consider shutting the place down. Mm -hmm. But the board of directors met and they said, uh, okay, we'll go out of business. And they voted on it. And at that point, they were out of business. I guess at that point, you can't even close the meeting because there's nobody on the board anymore. <laughs> but they came out and they told the staff what they had done. And the staff said, you can't do that. We would work for free if we could, just to keep this place going, mm -hmm. because they really believed in what they were doing. There are books from New Alchemy Institute mm -hmm. that you can buy online, mm -hmm. and there are, many of them are wonderful books. I have a... How-to books. Yeah, how-to books. Books. How books. I yeah. have a book on aquaponics, and it's fascinating. Aquaculture, I should say, it's fascinating. Um, and it's a classic book on aquaculture. A guy named McClarney wrote it. But 
the people who were on the board came out and said, we're closing down, and the, and the, the staff said, don't do it. And it was too late. They had already done it. There was no way that they could undo that. <laughs> so from a legal point of view, it was a, it was a fait accompli. It was just over. And the, the, I went down there, and there were still people kind of wandering around, staff people wandering around, looking like they were completely in shock. I'm sure they were. And they had, they had some things going on there that were fascinating. They had a genetic dome that had a bunch of fish tanks in it. They were raising trout in the fish tanks. When I went in the last time, the only thing in the fish tanks was, was mosquito larvae. The mm -hmm. trout had been removed. Mm -hmm. But also in the same building was a fig tree. Mm -hmm. And it was covered with figs. Wow. And the neighborhood kids would come in and pick the figs yeah. and eat them. Yeah. And they had a lot of that sort of thing, you know. Um, but it's anyway. a shame that the workers there didn't get together and form a co-op and just keep it going. Well, the under a different name, under yeah, a different it, yeah. The problem was the ownership of the property. Who yeah, owns the property? Yeah, yeah. And the owner, the property that they were on, which was an extensive piece of property, had been not donated but loaned. Oh. And and the person said, "This is going to be your property." Until you go out of business, if you do, in which case it will have to be returned we to We get me. it back. And so the ownership of the property was wrong. You know, the, the people couldn't start a co-op. I mean, every, it just went out of business. It oh, was sure. very sad. Because it was a great place. It was a great place. And it had a store where you could buy compact fluorescent light bulbs at a time when it was really hard to find those. For and some. For some, yeah, yeah. I can. I, I only joke that because I was, I was selling them, and distributing. When them. was that? In the eighties. Yeah, 80s. I converted completely to compact fluorescence in about nineteen eighty-two, eighty-three, uh -huh. yeah. and in those At that days. Time, the PLs were about the only thing you could get. Well, the, what what I did was I bought these things that you could screw into a light bulb socket, mm -hmm. and they had a thing that went up like this, and then there was a round. Circular, a circular bulb. Yeah. That okay. Was above yeah. it. I had them. Yeah. Yeah. And and they they were pretty good. Now you know I went down to Brown and Roberts and bought some LEDs for five dollars and they're very very nice. Yeah. Very nice LEDs. Very very nice light. Five dollars is not a bad price. It's subsidized. I don't know how they do be. that. I don't know how they do that. They There's, will be down to five dollars, but they're not yet. Well, not in, in reality. Yeah. Um, they have some LEDs down there for uh, not, not LEDs from compact fluorescent lights. Some of them are at like a dollar each. Yeah, that makes really sense. Yeah, they are heavily subsidized. Yeah, and yeah, those yeah. are something I'd like to move away from. Well, their time on Earth is limited. Yes, they're, they they are ready. They're almost at the point of being eclipsed by LEDs. Simply because the price of LEDs is becoming more attractive. And they say the price of LEDs is going, you know, I, I read about eight months ago that it would go down in, it would go down um, to, it would go down 80% within two years. I wrote an article for Green Energy Times. That'll kill compact for less yeah. coal. I read it, wrote an article for, for Green Energy Times that was talking about a, a place called LED Dynamics or LED Dynamics, mm -hmm. which is a manufacturer of LED lights in Vermont, oh, yeah. and they make they make a, a, a tube type thing. You can just take your, take fluorescent, your fluorescent tube out yeah. and pull it in this LED thing. They're expensive. They are expensive. That's right. But they work. Yeah, they just pop they right work. in. And and for many applications, they're less expensive than the fluorescents because you know you go into a factory and you look up there and there's a fluorescent tube, forty feet up. And it's flickering. Flickering. <laughs> yeah, and you say, okay, we have to replace that thing. What are we going to do? Well, you call um, maintenance. The maintenance people come in with a 40-foot tall ladder, step ladder. <laughs> this is set up by two guys or yeah. three guys or something like that. And then somebody climbs up there and does this thing, and then he climbs back down again. And in the meantime, nobody can walk under this, yeah. which means that... <laughs> The, the, that section of the factory has probably got to be closed down while you're doing it because it can't be in operation very well, likely. Basically, they don't do much of that. What they'll and do is costs... they'll, they'll work on, on statistics 
and when a certain amount of bulbs burns yeah. out, like 8%, yeah. they throw them all out. Yes. And replant, relamp everything on a weekend and yeah. an outside contract. Yes. That's equipped to do it, will come in. Right. <laughs> all that's gone. right. So it's, it's group, done. Group, instead group, of group, having group, a... Yeah, yeah, instead of having a having a, 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 a step ladder, you have a a, cher a cherry picker. Uh, yeah, a machine or something yeah. like that. Yeah. And and the, but the economics of the thing is such that even if an even if an LED light costs eighty dollars compared to the fluorescent, which costs what five? Yeah, okay, give me five. You know, it may be less expensive to replace this thing with the with the LED because you don't have that problem of the thing going out of uh, uh, out of service so quickly. Well, some of the LEDs are talking about a hundred thousand hours. Oh wow! And you can buy thirty thousand hour fluorescents. Really? Yeah, the standard fluorescent is twenty thousand. Oh, is it? Okay. So thirty thousand right. isn't a, isn't great shakes. Now that bulb's going to cost you ten ten twelve dollars maybe. Okay. But it's probably worth it. Yeah. And generally, with that. In addition to the uh, longer life, you get a better quality light. Right. You know, it's a premium fluorescent, you know, and it has several things lumped in there to justify the extra price. Yeah. So you get a higher color rendering index. You get a higher, uh, well, you get your choice of color of, of color uh, temperature. So you get a warm, uh, cool, medium, intermediate, mm -hmm. you know, or... Or you can get way the heck out on the blue end of the spectrum if you're doing things like growing turtles. Yeah. <laughs> growing turtles? Why uh, would you want blue? I guess blue... it's lizards. I guess, oh. I guess... Why would you want blue light for them? I specifically don't know, but uh, they do sell okay. uh, blue fluorescent specifically. For I was home. reading about a company that ha they take old shipping containers mm -hmm. that um, are no longer in service. All right, the sorts of things that they put on ships. Yeah. You know, the yeah, yeah. things that you would put on a tractor trailer and no, drive I, around. I don't exactly what they they took take the well for for anybody watching. They, there has to be an explanation for this, and they turn this these things into greenhouses. Makes sense. All right, but they don't remove any part of the roof or the walls. Oh, they light them. They light them with with LED lights oh, or fluorescent they're lights. They're growing something clandestine, aren't they? Well, we don't know that, <laughs> but um, but they they you can mount PVs on the roofs of these things, yeah. put batteries yeah, in yeah. them, and have the whole thing operated entirely from a from a a, a renewable system. It's and you can do it good. anywhere. Yeah. So you could you could grow whatever food you want mm -hmm. anywhere that you can have this thing. Where you've got exposure to the sun. That's really all you need. You can collect mm -hmm. your heat. You can collect your and your light. And and we're back to this business of of sixty thousand pounds of food per year per acre. And you got no no pests in there. You have no pests exactly. For for an average sized family, a, a vehicle of that size would probably be well in excess of what they need. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. So twenty footer probably would work it. Yeah. Yeah, twenty and twenty foot. You could buy a twenty foot floor, a twenty foot container for about a grand. You really? Yeah, you uh, on eBay. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Of course, it'll cost you. You're going to have to truck it. That's yeah. you know, as is where is. Yes. You remind me of a guy who told me that he was thinking of buying a submarine because he discovered he could buy it for $10,000. <laughs> <laughs> and you then he realized he'd have to pay a docking fee of $5,000 a day. <laughs> Getting back to the aquapunk, uh, aqua, aquapuncture. <laughs> aqu aquapuncture? Aquaponics. <laughs> aquaculture. There's a couple in town that is working on exactly this. Yes. And I've heard them several times on a local radio show, like yes. local. Yes. I believe their last name, or it may be hyphenated, but one of it is Crowther. Now, how do Crowther. you spell that? C R O W T H E R. Okay. And yeah. they're doing in their home. Yes. Aqu aquaponics. aquaponics. Yes. Aquaponics. I have I have heard and them. They're mixing both of them, you know, yeah. and running just exactly as you described. Yeah. I have. I think I've heard they're writing talk. books about it. I think they're yeah. they're exporting the knowledge. I think yeah, they are. 
They're giving talks. I've I've heard okay, them talk. Okay, so you've heard them talk. So yeah, you know I went exactly up to I'm talking I went up to Bellows Falls and heard them, up there. Mm -hmm. Not that I really had to go to Bellows Falls to hear them, but it was an interesting thing because it happened at the dam, and you know they have the uh, yeah yeah and they yeah. have the they have a fish ladder at that dam. Yeah yeah. Which is an interesting fish ladder because you can go in and you can watch the water going through it. There's, there's a fish ladder down in Vernon that you can see too. Yeah. Okay. The old Vernon Dam. Yeah. Which is still in operation. Yeah. And which is not delivering power to Vermont Yankee as a backup. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that story. There's got to be I a story. Yeah, there. I know there is a story there. I don't know what it is, but I've I've heard the reason. I don't you know I don't, I don't know what the actual reason is, but it's. It's, it is a story. Maybe we could get the Crowthers in here sometime. Now, there's an idea. Particularly if we could set it up, and we can set it up, that we could show some films. Absolutely, yeah. Let's do that. Uh. It, that would be a very interesting thing to do. You know, and another thing that I've thought about, too, and you could do it the same way, or you could combine it with it, would be raising small birds. Um, I don't know, know that I'd want to raise a goose this way, but... You know, there's chickens and there's ducks, and some of these some of these are small enough that you could raise a number of them in a greenhouse. You don't have to have the thing confined to a greenhouse during the mm -hmm. during the summer and the, mm -hmm. well, actually during any season except for the except for the winter, and <clears throat> also raising. Well, you got to protect them from predators. You do, that's correct. Um, and you know, we had a neighbor. Uh, had chickens, and the chickens were a number of the chickens were killed by a dog. The dog just went in and just took, went in and went took six of them. Uh, didn't eat them, just killed them. No, actually, this was this was a, a stray, looked very skinny, oh, he was and hungry. he was hungry. But he he went in, killed a chicken, took it out, put it somewhere, went back, killed another chicken, went out. Took, he was taking <laughs> these things out there. one at a time, yeah. and I'm sure that he was storing them away yeah. someplace. And in the winter, he was probably able to get away with it. Yeah. But he was not caught. I'm sure that the that the you know the police came and they saw him, or her. But you know, anyway, I've, I was also thinking about small animals, um, like rabbits, small mm -hmm. mammals mm -hmm. like rabbits. Guinea pigs have been raised for food, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, there are parts of Europe where people still eat dormice. <laughs> I hadn't heard that yeah, one. Yeah, well, there is an animal called the edible dormouse. And you can look it up in Wikipedia. And it doesn't look a whole lot like a mouse. It's, huh. not, it's not really a mouse. But it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an animal that is a little, bit, it's a little bit bigger than a chipmunk. And it does not have a bare tail, so it doesn't look like a rat. Huh. I don't know do dormice. Uh, you know, what story was a dormouse in? I don't remember. Some kid's I, story. With Alice in Wonderland, yeah, yeah, Alice in Wonderland yeah. And a dormouse. yeah, and they the, the thing about the dormice is they sleep a lot. That's probably why they call them dormice. It actually is. <laughs> yeah, it has nothing to do with doors. It has no, to do it with with, with vous. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and so you know, I've thought about those things. I don't like the idea of killing animals. I don't like the idea of killing fish, but. Um, you know, these are you have to eat, and I am not going to be a be a uh, uh, vegan because I I think there's a kind of a anti scientific prejudice in that. <laughs> so anyway, there is that. I think perhaps we should wrap it up. Well, we've we've gone done another hour, so yeah, I, think, I think yeah, it's about end. that time. It's going to be interesting. I've to got see pictures this. here I could show. Oh, but, uh, what have you got? I've got, I've got uh, North Dakota. North Dakota. Oh, good. I'm run through that real quick. I'll Man. Look up on a screen. Yeah, let's look at what happens when you get fracked. I'll look it up on a screen. This, this is a picture of an old geezer. No, I'm an old geezer. <laughs> this is a geothermal geezer. <laughs> That's right. Uh, this we specialize in site, geezers on the show. <laughs> this, this particular site is uh, planned on, it's going to be, Turned into a geothermal. Where site. is it? I think it's in California. Oh, really? I think so, but I'm oh. not sure. Wow. But it looks pretty neat, you know. You know, I I read something about a place called the Valley of the Ten Thousand Smokes. 
Yes, yes. And there was a there was a, a guy who was a who was a, a a missionary who went there to to teach the Indians, and he, I think it was the Valley of the Ten Thousand Smokes, but it was a place in Alaska where they had a lot of geysers or a lot yeah, of hot springs, yeah. and he built a. Isn't the temperature in that valley temperate? Sort of. Yeah. And he built a greenhouse. Yeah. N amongst these things, and maybe there might have been screens, uh, springs under the greenhouse, but he was raising tropical plants in this greenhouse yeah. in Alaska without heating them because. Yeah. 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 I've heard the story, maybe from you. I don't know. Well, you know, I have the same story. I just repeat it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, North Dakota. Yeah. And I'll try to pull this up. Oh, where's my mouse? There it is. Oh, wrong, wrong picture. And that is the size of the Bakken This is a, a map of the Bakken Shale. Oh, wow. The yellow part there is the Williston Basin, which is the Bakken Shale. It's just a specialized area within it. And apparently there's hydrocarbons throughout the Williston Basin, which goes from all the way from Saskatchewan down to South Dakota and well into Montana. Yep. But the only part of it that's being exploited right now is the Bakken Shale, which is a oil shale. It's the next step beyond oil sands. It's oil sands that have solidified, if you will. And in order to get the uh, oil out of it, you've got to frack it. There's no, no other way. I guess you could mine it and refine it that way. I, I seem to think that that's what they thought people would do when I was they in college. They might have started doing that even. Yeah, I remember in college people talking cheaper. about it talking about the the, the the way of you would extract this and people saying, well, it's going to happen. And so you, that's, that's the area we're talking about in the back in shale. Most of the part that's being exploited now is in northwestern North Dakota. Yeah. But the potential extends up into uh, you know, Canada and Montana. You know what we should do, Tom? I know that it's going to be worthwhile to spend more than two or three minutes on this, and we're getting up to the end of the second oh, we hour. Are. Yeah, we are so why don't we, hour. why don't we do this next time, <coughs> or the time after? No, it's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere, and we could devote a good, <laughs> a, a good amount of time to the pictures. That's not one of them. <laughs> yeah. But this one is. I've got a whole bunch of pictures there. Yeah. Ouch. This is, uh, well, you can sort of see what it used to look like in yeah. that picture. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll uh, Let's we'll do that. It, cause it, yeah, we could do this. This, yeah, we this could, could spend, take a half an hour. Yeah, we could spend half an hour Usually. on that easily. Yeah, and and maybe we should we should schedule that. I, I think James Perkins is probably going to want to talk for for um, longer than we would have him normally in the show, and so he's going to want to go through the second hour. I'm just guessing. No, well, like I said, it's not going anywhere. Yeah, it's staying right on that little fun drive. So okay, good. It's here. Yeah. So we. Uh, well, but I, th I th as I said, I think this deserves half an hour. And we're going to have people going through very soon. <clears throat> so we will say goodbye to our audience. Whatever's left of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed.